Thank you. Uh, nice meeting you all again. So this is on the streaming patterns, like how you build the streaming patterns, uh, why we need patterns. Um, so the basic goal here is to uh, uh, the business scenarios, uh, some of the business scenarios that you can build using the patterns, why we need patterns, and we have 11 kind of patterns that we can use to build streaming applications. So those are like kind of the building blocks that you put together and build the whole system. Uh, and how stream processor can help you to build this whole uh, stuff. And some little stuff about how you develop, deploy, and monitor the application. Right? So this is what we have for today. So these are some of the things that you can do, like with this real-time state streaming data integration, real-time ETLs, generating stream from the source, notification management, real-time decision making, and Srinath also talk about lots of stuff. So these are some of the use cases that you can basically build. And we have patterns because patterns will basically help you to simplify stuff and understand, OK, the building blocks of what you really need to do. And it can help you to solve your problem in a much easier way. And that will also help you to learn some best practices and get it done much, much faster. So when it comes to the streaming engine, the WSO2 stream processor, uh, we have some use cases on, along, on that. And so these are some of the patterns, the segments that we will, I will be covering on this particular stuff. So different ways of data collection, different ways of data cleansing, or different ways of doing transformation, how you can do data enrichment, and then how you can do data summarization, rule processing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, data pipelining, how you can publish data, how you can sometimes do on-demand on processing. right? So you're not, you can always want, sometimes you need synchronous response. Uh, and data presentation. So these are certain stuff that we will be looking at. And if you take the whole stream processing pipeline, so you need to have each of these building blocks to build your whole scenario. So based on your scenario, the items that you pick out of this might change. But you can basically build the whole stuff that from this, like data collection. So, so we have the streaming data integration. So as part of that, you might do data cleansing, data transformation, and pipeline the data. You're trying to do data enrichment part. So you also have to do some sort of analysis, like um, streaming summarization, rule processing stuff. You want to do some machine learning models with uh, uh, machine learning. And you can sometimes store the data. You want to present that. You want to publish that. Or, or if you want, sometimes you also need on-demand on processing of the data. Right. So data collection. So you can collect data in three different forms. Right? So one thing, you can go and subscribe to a stream, like Kafka, JMS, or uh, RabbitMQ. So these are some of the connectors that we allow, support. We can also be passive and receive messages from others. Right? So if somebody is sending to us, we can just con consume that. HTTP message, e uh, uh, TCP, so if someone sends an email, we can consume that. Or else we can go and extract information from some sources, like change data capture. So we have support to, to identify a change in a database, and you can passively go and uh, crawl the database and get those information or from a file. And when you get this information, the data can come on different formats, like JSON, XML, text, binary, key value pair, CSV, Avro, and WSO2 it is our own format. So these are some of the formats that we support for retrieving data. And this is how you basically query that, right? So when you collect some data, like for example, J uh, JSON message, right? So you can say just JSON, then you have to send it on the format that we expect, like it's an event and the name and the values, right? But if you have a custom JSON message, then you have to basically give the pattern of okay, how you can extract the name and the amount from the base and message that is coming in. So that's some simple annotations to that. So same thing for other data types as well, which I'm not going to go into the details. So that's, that's simple as data collection. And when it comes to data cleansing, if you want to cleanse the data, like clean, clean the data, so you can filter the data out, right? So you can just give some value ranges or string manipulations, regular expressions, any of those stuffs are supported. And sometimes you want to set some defaults, like if the data has some null values, like you're consuming from different sources. Some sensor is sending uh, pressure and temperature. Another one is just sending the temperature. So what do you do? So if you want to put them together, how you can basically put that? Sometimes you have to do null check, if then else clauses, whatever those stuff. You can do that. So for example, here, what we are basically doing, doing is in the production stream, if the item is cake, and if, if the amount is, if there's a wrong reading or something, if the amount can be zero, less than zero, I may put it to zero. Like I just reset the value to zero and put it out. Right? So, 
And th that is a simple way of data cleansing part. So you can also do data transformations. Like the incoming data can be on any format, right? But what WSO2 stream processor internally process is a tuple, like it's an array of values. So that value can contain either string, int, fallout, long, double, bool, or an, even an object. Of object can be a JSON or whatever that you want. So if the input message is of any of these format, we can convert it to a tuple, and then we reconvert it to any format that you really want. So in this particular processing that we have a thing called input mapping, when we retrieve the data, as I told you earlier, we can put an at mapping, and just you can map the data to a tuple. Or we have a JSON processing functions, like if you want to extract data out of a JSON message, a complex JSON message. Or we have a map function, so if we have a hash map of values, how do you basically process that? A string manipulation. All of those are ways of doing extracting data and making them as tuple. And then you can also rebuild them using output mapping, JSON, uh, again, JSON processing functions, map functions, and string functions. So this is a simple example of how you can select some. So if you have a JSON message, if you want to extract some information on real time, and you want to put it to a stream, and you want to, you can rebuild them as, as well. So this is a simple transformation of values. But you can also do a single event transformation. Like if you want to uh, do some simple mathematical operations, you can call functions. You have, we have 60 plus extensions, not just functions, uh, like extensions themselves, like string, um, math, or even like machine learning stuff. Um, uh, natural language processing. We have lots and lots of extensions, so you can uh, geographical processing. All of those are, are part of the pro product. And if you can, you can also write your own custom um, uh, um, JavaScript or Java or R function, and then you can invoke when the data comes in. So these are some ways of doing a data transformation in real time. When we have the data transformed. We might sometimes want to enrich the data, right? So the, all of this time, we are doing just looking at one event, and we are trying to transform that particular event into different, different formats. So now you might want to connect to some other systems and integrate that, right? So two ways of integrating or enriching the data is by calling a database or calling a service, right? So so far, what we covered we cover is RDBMS stores. It can be MySQL, MSSQL, Oracle, Postgres, and also NoSQL stores like uh, MongoDB, HPS, Cassandra. If you have an in-memory grid, we can work with Hazelcast Redis, or indexing systems like Solar, Elasticsearch, and you can also process in memory. Like CD has a capability of storing data in memory and processing them there itself. And we also can call a service and get a response and enrich the data as well. Like if you take the database scenario, right? So we can basically have a stream of data coming in, like this is a production stream. And then we have a database that we have written, which is called the production info table. So we have an information about that. So this can have some primary keys, in indexes. And in this particular case, if we have not defined the add store annotation, the data will be stored in memory. But if you want to store it into an RDBMS, then you have to put an add store annotation and give some RDBMS a database, a, a table. Then whatever the modification that you do to this table will reflect on that particular RDBMS table. So the same will apply for all the NoSQL databases, so the in-memory grid, or anything that you want to do. So then you basically write the joining query, like from production stream. I join the production info table. If the IDs uh, are equal, then I just want to get the name and the amount. I want to enrich that data with some information and just put it out. So that's simple as that. And the same way that you can also do service calls. Like, so we have the input stream. We call the sync. We call output. So the service can respond in multiple ways. Sometimes it can respond the correct message. Sometimes it may be a 404. The service is not available, right? So you basically, based on the results, you have multiple consumers to consume the response and to continue processing of about the data, right? So if the service is not available, sometimes you want to put the data into a queue and retry it some, sometimes afterwards. Or you want to send a different alert. OK, I couldn't do something. You have to basically handle the failures. But if it is successful, then what you do based on that? So you, with the enriched data, that you can do some other processing. So that's about that. Then the data summarization. So all of this, so now we get the data, we enrich that. Sometimes we want to summarize it and give more richer information rather than just giving each and every message. 
right? So if you want to summarize the data, there are multiple ways that we can summarize data. Something are time-based summarization, right? So we have a sliding window, like, OK, last one minute, like it's always sliding. At any given time, you're just going to look at last one minute from that point, right? Or you want to have a tumbling time window, like every one minute, like from 8.1 to 8.2, 8.2 to 8.3, like, uh, like likewise. And when you can also have various time scales, like, OK, from, from seconds to years, I really don't worry about the time scales. Like, I just want to know historically per second granularity, per minute granularity, per hour, per day, per month, per year. All the granularities, I want the analysis historically. So I can store it, and I can see the histograms and take some decisions. So those are time-based aggregations. And then we have event count-based aggregations, like sliding length or tumbling length. Then session-based, how much frequent that particular data is on that. So there are multiple ways that you can do aggregations on that. And along with that, we have multiple ways of the actual aggregations that you want to do. You want to do a sum, count, min, max, distinct count, standard deviation, and there are multiple other functions as well. So these are some of the functions that are supported uh, out of the box. And this is the one I was talking about. We have, um, uh, we have this Lambda architecture inbuilt into the system. So we try to use the databases, the normal traditional RDBMS databases, and the real-time data that comes in. The real-time information is calculated in memory. And the traditional uh, like historic information is periodically stored to the database. So you do some, like for, for this second, I process everything in memory, and I store it into a database. And I start processing the next second. So some information will be in memory. So current second, current minute, current hour, current year, all of those are in memory. And the last of all of those stuff will be stored in the database. So if you want to, if you are asking, OK, um, give me hourly results. The current hour will come from in memory, and the historical ones will come from the database. So you can kind of combine both and give you the results. So the results will be accurate to the millisecond. So that's the capability of this. And we can write a query, right? So from, we can basically define a thing called aggregation. That aggregation will automatically do that. And you can ask from this time to this time, give me per day granularity of sales. And you can basically plot something like that. So you can. On the dashboards, you can even change the per day to per minute, so then you get per minute granularity graphs. So that's a way of doing it. So then we also have rule processing. So all of these things is summarization. After summarizing, sometimes you want to write some particular rule and detect certain stuff, right? So there are multiple ways that you can write rule, right? So you can write a rule on a single event. Like you can put an if statement, else statement, a match of regular expressions, and you can try to understand an abnormal event. Or else, you can correlate some of the events, like using the data summarization patterns that you like. So over, o over time, you aggregated something, and now you're getting sense out of that. So that is building on top of summarization. Or else, sometimes you want to store the data into a window or a table, and then you want to join with that and get some meaningful information out of that as well. So that is with the collection of data. And more important than that is the correlation of events. So which is identifying a pattern, like, for example, a smaller transaction followed by a larger transaction from two different regions. Or uh, a, a, an event has happened, and the following event has not happened, okay, which is supposed to happen. So why it not happen? So I want an alert. Right? Or else um, a, a sequence of happen, events happening, like whether it's increasing or decreasing. If the system temperature is continuously increasing, send me an alert. Those things like that. Like, this is a simple query of non-occurrence of a pattern. So what happened here is there is a delivery stream and a payment stream. So as and when the delivery is done, immediately you have to get a payment back. OK, so that is, that is the expectation of this scenario. So for every delivery, we call that as E1, followed by there is no payment for the same order ID for 15 minutes. So there's a delivery has happened and there is no payment for 15, min 15 minutes, then I want to get to know about that delivery information. Right? So this is a non-occurrence of something. So when this thing happens for 15 minutes, we just wait and see if the other thing happens. If, if the payment arrives, then there is no notifications. If the payment didn't happen, then we have a notification at this point. So if we just remove the not and, and maybe the for time, then 
when the payment happens, you get the notification. So you can write multiple combinations of that, right? So you can have, um, and this can be even like multiple followed by conditions. So it can be very complex. So this is a way of identifying a pattern. So, so far, we are basically writing the rules. So you know what is happening. You know how to find the problem, or you know find, find the solution. So you write the rule. You tell the system how to process it. Right? But there are cases that you really don't know how to process it. Right? So you just have examples. You don't, you don't know how to write the rule. Or the rule, writing rules are so complex that you can't uh, physically do that. So that is where this machine learning comes in. So what we have categorized the machine learning part into three categories, right? Uh, anomaly detection, um, serving predefined pre machine learning models, or doing online machine learning, right? So when it comes to anomaly detection, so we have thing called marker models, which basically understand abnormal patterns. Like, um, um, for example, it will try to learn your credit. Like, for example, if you are if you are purchasing some items and you are using some card of credit card, you basically use the same credit card for same type of transaction. You you know you use the card for um, groceries always. Like, if you go to supermarket, you always tend to use the same card. So it, it try to identify your pattern. Like every week, you, uh, you do this kind of transaction in the supermarket kind of stuff. So it kind of understand that. Suddenly, if you start using that for online transactions here and there, it is, it's a different pattern. So it can identify a pattern change and alert you. Right? So that is all of them are done through probabilities. So that is a way of automatically identifying abnormalities. And then we have this predefined. Uh, uh, machine learning models, which is you can use Python, R, Spark, or whatever that language that you like. You collect the data, you crunch it, you build the model. You can export that model as a PMML, so which is predictive markup modeling language, which most of the systems support. So then we can import that into Siddhi or the stream processor. We can do real-time predictions. Or we also support TensorFlow. You can, if you have a TensorFlow model, a Java model, then you can import that and call uh, the system. If you, if that particular machine learning system is not capable of converting your message into a PMML or a TensorFlow model, then what you have to do is you have to create a service and you have to use the service integration to call that and enrich your information, whether you want whether, what the prediction information. So, so that's the worst case scenario. And then we have this online machine learning capability of clustering, classification, and regression. We have done a lot of extensive research. We identify the best and latest algorithms on that, and we have implemented that. So we have only four algorithms implemented on that, but those are the best on the system. So we didn't go and implement everything. Um, so we have tested on those particular cases. So this is a simple example of serving the model. So when you have the model, you just give the model address and pass a stream into it, and it just give you the output. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. So this is how you serve a model, but I'll try to demonstrate a, a scenario of, um, of online training and online learning uh, on, on, on the tutorial sessions that is coming tomorrow. So data pipelining. So these are the things that you can do, but without a rich data pipelining solution, you can't bind all of these things together. So how you can basically do that? Sometimes you want to do the processing in a sequential way, right? So you want to when the stream event comes in, first you want to do the first query, then you do the second query, and continue. Right? So the system is defined, implemented by default to work like that. So when you, when you receive the message, the same thread goes through the whole the stuff and do the processing. We did like that because that is the, when we test the system, that is the most fastest way that we can do. And we were able to do 3 million events per second. In, everything is in memory if you embed the system. If you are running externally, it can work up to 100k events per second without database interactions. If you have database interactions, then it can go even further down because the databases have their own maximum capacity. And if you're calling services, that is based on the speed of the service. So, so those are some, ex if when the external environment comes into the picture, the throughput can go uh, slightly down than 100k, but this is what we have identified. So the default behavior is sequential data processing. So you process the data sequentially in a pipeline approach. But there can be cases that you want to get the data and you run it parallelly. So you can say put the asynchronous annotation and say, OK, buffer the data. So this is the buffer size. You can give a buffer size. You can say how many workers that you want to process from that point and what would the batch of that stuff. So 
if the batch size is five, then every worker will process zero, one to five messages. Because they go to the buffer. If the buffer has only two messages, they just get those two messages, go to the processing. When they come back, if there are 10 messages, they only get five. So the maximum is five. But they don't wait till all five comes. They try to process. Even if one is there, they just get it and go. And when they come back, if their buffer is full, they get up to five. So that is how we process it. Because the latency is a key aspect of the system, so we don't want to unnecessarily wait for people to send messages. Right? So, so you can make the system synchronous. You can make the system asynchronous. And then also, sometimes, you have to, you have to make the system to trigger the stuff to start the processing. You know, if it, is a, uh, if it is a database or something, you want to periodically join with the database and get some uh, thing going on. So you can basically have a trigger. So you can give a con expression, or you can give a particular time pattern, uh, and it periodically sends a message. And you can start the pipelining flow from that particular point. And more than that, we also have scenarios where we want to scatter the data, process parallelly, and join them. So that, that is also a way of a scatter gather processing pattern. Right? Sometimes what you basically do is, OK, when you have a JSON, if it's array of JSON array, you want to get each of those elements. So what you basically do is we basically tokenize a JSON. So it becomes uh, a one event will become five events. But, but it's still together, five events. And then you go through the sys pipeline. And you basically do the processing. For now, each event, you do some manipulation. You enrich that or do certain stuff. Okay? And then it basically comes to another thing called window batch, which is a batch window. You collect all five and, again, put them together. Right? So you again create a complex JSON out of it and put it out. Right? So you, when the data comes in, you scatter them. You process each of them individually. And then you put back and put it out. So you can do that for string, JSON, and anything that you really want. And there are cases where you want to dynamically add the rules. Right? So I have a pipeline. Based on my business decision, sometimes certain things happen. Okay? There, so you have an input application, like you have this notification stuff happen, something, management. If you're a notification system, you know things are happening. So that is the input. And different users can come and define different rules for, for notification. So those things happen dynamically. And then you have the output. So if you want to put all of those rules in the same application, so every change, you have to change the whole application again. But now what you can basically do with the stream processor is to break each of the, you can build each use case separately, and you can wire them in memory. Right? So you can hot deploy different rules, and it simply works. Right? So you can basically alter the pipeline in different ways. So when you have a dynamic thing like that, uh, I'll also, the, the citizen integration part also comes into that. I'll explain that in a while. So when you want to publish data out, one of the easiest ways of publishing is we send the messages through the data syncs, right? So multiple uh, syncs are supported in different formats. And you can also load the data to a database. Like you can you insert, update, delete, or read data to the databases. Uh, and when we are publishing the data out, that also uses the same kind of format, right? So you can have a default message out, or you can build your custom message. When you're building the custom message, you have to say where this name and amount should come. So you basically put that together and put it out. So on-demand processing. So all of these are asynchronous streaming processing. Sometimes you want to on-demand process the data. right? So we have some data collection points, like a window will collect some information, last one minute information. Or we have some aggregations done. Or we have a table that may be in memory, or they may be backed by a database. So you have, we have REST APIs that you can call and see, OK, the status of one in-memory data. And you can, on demand, get an on in one minute average out. So that is a way of doing on-demand processing on the streaming flow. Right? A different way of processing is on-demand querying the system. Right? So we, have the we are sensing the environment, so we are currently sensing what is happening in the environments to streaming sources, and we might be doing some streaming alerting part as well. Right? But at the meantime, I want to send some information and get a response in a request response way from the system. So this is what we do with the identity server. So the identity server system will basically sense the environment, or even the API management throttling is happening like this. We sense the environment. We understand what is happening. 
and then we call, do a synchronous call and say, should I allow this user or not? The system will look at the environment and tell you yes or no. Right? So the system is updated synchron asynchronously from the systems, and the call that you send will go through multiple of those queries and will come back to you in a synchronous way. So that is a way of querying your system in a synchronous way. And data presentation, how you can present this data to someone, right? So first of all, you can load the data to the data store, RDBMS, NoSQL in memory stores. So you can use any database, uh, the database related uh, visualization tool to visualize the data from that. So that is one part of it. We can expose the data through REST APIs. So there are multiple forms that we can expose. So one is REST APIs. And we also have our own data presentation stuff, which is a dashboard, where you, I explained to you on the previous talk as well. We have fine-grained permissions, localization, intermediate communication on those particular stuff. And with the latest release, we have also report generation stuff. So you, where you can go to a dashboard, and you can export uh, the current full dashboard or a content of that. Or you can also periodically generate just the reports out of that. So that is one another thing that we can we have added recently. So those is part of presentation. So with all of these stuff putting together, you can basically build the stream processing application. Right? So these are some of the patterns that we that but some of the building blocks that you can put together and build your own thing. Right? So how you basically build and monitor that is through our studio. So you can edit it Everything is on there. You really don't need to start up two servers or copy from one front to another one. So everything is integrated in that. It's very, very easy for you to start and use that. And if you want citizens integration, you can get one of the app implemented. You can annotate that. And you can basically put it to this. So on demand, when the user basically enters the data stuff here, the dynamic CD application will be deployed. So it can connect to the other CD applications, other streaming applications. and and give some more information or more rules to the whole pipeline. So this can be added in a dynamic way. And deploying of this, we can deploy that on the end system as a sidecar, or we can embed that. Or if you want high availability of the nodes, we can just have two node high availability with zero data loss. Or if you want a real distributed deployment, and if you're going to go massive scale, then we also have a distributed deployment. Currently, the distributed deployment depends on Kafka, but we are, we have, we are, we are implementing alternative ways to do the distributed deployment without Kafka also. And the monitoring streaming application is supported by the status dashboard, so which give you node levels, see the, see the app level, see the query level, performance statistics of the whole stuff. So you can basically know if the system is down, up, and how it is behaving. Uh, and to summarize, WSO2 stream processor is kind of lightweight stream processing system where we kind of try to do the streaming data integration and streaming analytics use cases. We have um, the rich uh, streaming query language out of all the stream processors in the market. And we also are implementing a graphical drag and drop editor. Currently, the graphical drag and drop editor is not the best. It's, it's, we are just starting on that. But uh, we, we, are, we have been a lot of development happening on improving the graphical editor. Uh, but the streaming query editor was pretty good and solid. Uh, and we have multiple deployment options you can deploy on the edge. So in the future, we'll also provide direct support to deploy it or embed the application into your, uh, to, with your application. So we, have, we are going to provide support to, to CD itself. Right, so as a library, you can just embed that, and we can get support, production support for that. And then we also have, we are going, I mean, going through a research on micro stream processing, so to enable you into a microservice environment, and two-node deployment, a highly scalable deployment, and streaming machine learning, long-running long aggregations, and the citizen integration support. So these are the business scenarios uh, that we can basically build out of this, which we are all talking about. And what we covered today is some business scenarios, why we need patterns, then 11 stream processing patterns, and how you can basically use that to build the whole system, how you can develop, deploy, and monitor the application. So that's all I have for today. Uh, do you have any questions?